trying to um that's the right one yeah that's my presentation there so um yes good afternoon everyone i'm craig mcadam i'm conservation director with bug life i've worked with bug life for nearly 14 years now and for that i worked for 11 years with uh, in this water industry in scotland um, my passion is fresh waters and I run the recording schemes for mayflies and stoneflies. Um, before I start on river flies, I'm, I'm sure many of you probably know bug life already, but but I'll just to give you a quick introduction. Um, we're the only organisation in Europe concerned with the conservation of all invertebrates. From spiders to starfish, mollusks to mayflies, our, our aim is to halt invertebrate extinctions and achieve sustainable populations of invertebrates in the UK. We do this through a number of activities. We inspire others by introducing them to the world of invertebrates around them. We take them out and we show them invertebrates. We undertake practical conservation work, such as this bog restoration uh, work that you can see in the top right hand corner there um, or the creation of wildflower areas for pollinators for instance and um, we shape policy through advocacy efforts and the development of position papers and strategies and we raise awareness through walks and talks workshops and media stories and webinars like this so but today i'm going to talk about river flies and um, so what are river flies well they're basically a grouping of message on the screen on that. Um, basically it's a grouping of three insect orders mayflies stoneflies and caddisflies and what i'm going to do today is i'm going to go through each of these and each of these orders and just give you a little flavor of their life cycles um, a bit of their ecology and show you some of the species that we get in the uk We'll start off with mayflies. Um, there are more than 3,200 species of mayfly in the world um, and in the UK we've got 52 species. Up until very recently we had 51 um, but we discovered a new species uh, about a year and a half ago and um, which was added to the list. But actually this breaking news is that there is another species that we think we've found in the UK so we've got potentially got 53 species. Um, None of those are endemic, so they're found elsewhere in the world. Um, but uh, in the UK, you can find mayflies pretty much across the whole of the UK. They start off uh, as with any insect uh, as an egg, um, and and basically the female mayfly is, is just an egg carrier. It, all it, all its body um, organs are pushed to the side to get as many eggs in there as possible. And some, some of the small um, species uh, will have up to 2,000 eggs, but the larger species can have anything up to 8,000 eggs in one female. When they lay the eggs, the, the eggs have these little structures that appear, um, which stop them from washing away. So they, they've got this sort of sticky attachment that sticks them to the, the bed of the river or onto um, uh, a structure or, or whatever. And it can be really distinctive. And some, some of the species in, in other parts of the world are identified by their egg rather than by the insect itself. Some species will actually crawl uh, down underneath the water. Uh, they'll find an exposed rock and they'll land on it and then actually crawl, pull themselves underneath the water and lay their eggs in these little patches. And you can see each of these patches is a tiny, uh, each of these patches has loads of tiny little eggs in it and sometimes you can find these rocks that are covered over with with basically generations after generations of, of eggs um, they're uh, once they've laid their eggs the females just wash away so they, they, they basically have one purpose uh, as an adult is to be out there and uh, lay their eggs the eggs develop um, over a period of time depending on temperature um, and as they develop, they go through various stages. So this is an egg of Ephemera danica, um, one of the common large mayflies um, you find on chalk streams and, and other, other rivers across the UK. And it goes through a series of changes in the egg. You can see this sequence here. 
it shows the form of the insect starting to develop there. Um, you can start to see the body segments um, towards the bottom of this image now. And then you can see the eye spots and the rest of the body firming up there. And then it hatches. And that can take anything up to, um, up to, well, it depends on, on temperature, but you know, right, usually about 30 days um, from hatching, but some species will stay in the egg stage for a lot longer. So this is um, this is a first instar nymph of Ephemera danica. You can see it looks very different to a mayfly in itself. It's not got any gills. Um, it's quite uh, stocky and um, a bit bristly. It looks a bit like a silverfish actually. And this is usually deep into the, in the gravels of the river or the, the, the lake. Different types of mayflies have different uh, periods of, of development, of egg development. So in that one, the, the top one there is the one that I've just shown you where the um, egg develops right the way through and it, it takes um, perhaps 30 days or so to, to hatch out. The bottom one is the blue-winged olive, Ceratella ignita. And it goes through the same process. It develops all the way through to stage six in this, this graphic. And at that point, it stops. It's just at the point where it's ready to uh, hatch out into the nymph stage. And that typically happens in late September or something. It's ready to hatch and it stops. And it stays like that all the way through the winter, stuck to the, you can see that on the, the bottom left of those eggs, there was this sticky patch. And that's stuck to the bottom of the river. And it's basically a, a, a mechanism for it to avoid the, the nymphs getting washed away during the, the, the winter. And so it stays in this diapod state, this uh, um, suspended sort of state and right through the winter and then when the, when the water temperatures rise again in sort of mid, uh, early April uh, it will then hatch out and the nymphs will start to develop very quickly over the, the summer. The nymphs are, um, look, majority of them look like this, they've got three tails, they've got long antennae and they've got these external gills down the, the abdomen. Um, as with all other insects, they've got three pairs of, of legs and, and the segmented body. In this one, you can see the developing, I don't know if you can see my, my point of it, um, you can see the developing wing pads here. So that's where the wings are developing inside the insect. Um, and this insect will stay in the water for, um, in this particular species, for um, several months before hatching out as an adult. Um, you get different varieties, you get different different shapes and, and, and sizes. This is a, another one which is specially adapted to live in fresh, in very fast flowing fresh water. Um, this is one of the heptogenidae and you can see it's really flat and really streamlined. Um, the head is sort of like brought down this aero, hydrodynamic um, uh, shape and this is these, this particular family of, of mayflies has been used to design new spoilers and things for cars because they're so efficient at, at, uh, at um, getting flows of, in this case, water over their body. Stick, to the, stick themselves to the, the um, bed. They, in common with all other insects, um, they've got this exoskeleton, this, this outer skin, which in order to grow, they need to molt, and that's known as an instar. And in mayflies, they can be up to 50 instars, so they can molt the skin 50 times within their life, life cycle, which often is a, a year. This is one of the common mayfly nymphs, um, Ephemera danica, and that you can see it's molted its skin in the top right of the image. That's the molted skin, and the fresh uh, new skin is on the um, nymph in the bottom left. And you see it's quite it's quite soft at this time, it's hardly patterned, um, and it will harden up over a, a period of time. When they're molting, they don't feed, they, they just, um, they're, they're just basically getting rid of that extra skin. And they're doing this 50 times, it's quite an energy um, uh, costly process. So after they've done that, they're, they've molted um, and grown to uh, size to emerge, they then they then have to get out of the water and what they they do is they'll, they'll have a couple of 
trial runs at this, they'll go up into the uh, up towards the surface and they'll they'll swim back down. When they're when they're ready to actually go for it, they'll come up to the surface. And as they do, the back of the thorax splits open, and on the thorax there's tiny little hairs which um, repel the water and makes a little window for them to actually come out onto the water on the water surface. And this is just an example of this happening with one of the betadae. Um, it's got to the surface. the The back of the nymph, the nymphal um, skin has split, and the hairs have made this little window for the insect to come out onto the surface. You can do this in huge numbers in some species. This, this, we, we were moth trapping at this on the shore of Windermere um, some years ago, and we'd set the moth trap up, and we're sitting back waiting for the moths to appear, and we could see smoke coming across um, Windermere, and we thought, well, there must, somebody must be having a barbecue or, or something like that. And it wasn't, it was actually this massive cloud of insects coming across. And this uh, landed in our trap. Um, and you can see here that there's actually hundreds upon hundreds of tiny little mayflies and the odd uh, non-biting midge in there as well. And these are all canidae. These are uh, silt dwelling mayflies that are typical. You, you find them in, in uh, places with, uh, you know, still waters with the silty um, beds. And this, yeah, they'd all emerged en masse and were attracted to our light. Um, it can happen in, in epic uh, scales in other parts of the world. This is a little sequence of, of weather radar, which has picked up a hatch of mayflies on Lake St. Clair uh, on the Canadian-American border. And this is, these, are in ten, these, these slides are in 10 um, minute intervals. So you can see that the, the hatch is building, 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 until that point there where you've got these two intense points of uh, activity. And those are the mating swarms. So that's where the males and the females have come together to mate. Um, and then half an hour later, sorry, an hour later, you get all the females going back to the lake to lay their eggs. Uh, and it's quite phenomenal the, the number of species that will come off this and they're, they're quite large mayflies to be picked up on, on weather radar. Um, this is what it looks like in real life. This is on the Mississippi. Um, this is Hectogenia lumbata hatching on the Mississippi. That's the weather data again. Um, you see the, the size of the hatch and that's the aftermath uh, in towns where they're all attracted to the lights. It tends to happen round about 4th of July, which is kind of un unfortunate. Um, for all the people that are going to the, the um, fun fairs and things because you can have these mass hatches. They put off um, warning sirens when the mayflies are hatching in, in La Crosse um, in Wisconsin they, because they, you need to shut your windows and your doors and, and make sure your outside lights are off and they, they put out snow plows to move them off the, the road, which is quite phenomenal. doesn't only happen in the US. Um, we also have the same we have mass hatches in Europe so these are just two road signs actually for uh, bridges over major rivers where mayflies hatch in large enough numbers to obscure the vision of of, uh, of drivers and even in the UK we have some really large hatches of species particularly early in the season the March Brown Richardina Germanica hatches in really good numbers on, on rivers like the Tweed and the Tay Once they've hatched, um, mayflies are unique as insects in that they need to, uh, they, they've got two adult stages, two wing stages. So they come off the river or, the, or, the, or come off the water um, in this stage here, which is called the submagle. And it will go off to the bank and it will land on some vegetation and then it's got to molt that skin once more. And what it does is it lowers its wings, spreads its wings, and as it does, the back of the thorax splits once more and the full imago can then crawl out of that skin. And as it does this, it's leaving that husk of a, a sub-imago skin uh, it, there. And it really is as quick as that. It happens really quickly. You, you can actually see this. If you can find a, a mayfly sub and stick it in a little watertight uh, tub or container and put it in your fridge, you can mimic the conditions of it being dark and cooler at night, and then bring it out maybe in five, 10 minutes, and it'll do the molt here and then. 
Um, they're the only insects that do this, and there's lots of theories about why they, they still retain this step. But it, it seems to be that they they need to they need that extra stage to be able to develop fully um, sexually, fully mature. Here's two examples of a, a subimago and a, a on the on the bottom and the imago on the top and the one on the bottom is a female and you can see it's it's brightly colored um it's got a fully colored um wings um they're not transparent and that's because there's another set of wings in inside there and um, so it obscures the, the the light getting through there the top one's a, a male imago and you see it's got much longer tails it's got much longer legs and that's um, one of the adaptations that the the one of the, the stages they need to get through to actually be able to mate because th those legs are used to hold on to the female when when they're mating. Uh, it's another one here, the uh, yellow mayfly Potamanthus luteus, um, and you can see that's that's the may the two they're both females, and you can see that the the difference between the uh, uh, subimago on the bottom and the mago on the top. You can see the um, longer tails in the um, the imago in particular, and the clearer wings. In in many of the male imagos, the the body is actually completely clear, um, and the the female has is colour in there because there's eggs in there. But in the male, there's absolutely nothing there. They don't feed as adults. Um, they the all the all they are doing uh, as a male is all the, the female is carrying the eggs and the male has just got the wing muscles and the sperm packet to pass on to the on to the female so just to finish off on the mayfly some adults um so uh we'll show you these ones first which have three tails um so we have in the top left is probably our smaller, one of our smallest uh, species. This gets to about three or four millimetres um, and is the one that came in huge numbers to us at Windermere and um, Canis Macurura. Um, Ceratella igniter in the, in the top right is really common and you could probably find that almost anywhere in Britain, I would suggest, um, and on rivers. Ephemera danica is our largest mayfly. It grows to about 25 millimetres. Um, is more common in the south of the country, but you do find it in um, little areas of limestone um, geology. And Paraleptophlebia submarginata is a, a, a medium-sized uh, species, maybe about 10 to 15 millimetres, um, which is found on, on rocky streams, stony streams. They've all got three tails. If you remember, the, the, the nymphs also had three tails. Um, but some theme, some adults have only two tails. They've lost a, a tail um, through evolutionary processes. I should actually point out that back on this one, um, if you can see the hind, whoops, that one, on the hind wings here, there's a tiny, there's a hind wing there and there and there. But this one doesn't have any hind wings at all. So that's another way of separating out some of the the, the family. Well, that's more important in this group here, where we've got uh, only two tails, and um, we've got largish hind wings here and here, uh, no hind wings in this species, and only tiny hind wings you can hardly see uh, in this species here. And these are really useful when you're actually separating out. It separates out to give you just a handful of species um, to go to ID further. Um, these species. Amelitis and Opinatus in the top left is an upland species, which is found, um, uh, which is actually retreating upland, uh, up, up hills. It's um, affected by climate change. It doesn't like warm water um, and is struggling to survive in, in lowland areas. Um, Rithogenus semicolorata is really common, um, probably found across most bony, um, fast flowing rivers. Chloean diptrum is the most successful mayfly in the world. Um, it's found in every continent apart from Antarctica, or it's, it's colonized every continent apart from Arta in Antarctica. It was originally known or, or distributed in North America and in Europe, um, but it's, it's found in butts, um, ponds, any sort of still water um, and I regularly see them in my garden here when there's no water for 
um, maybe about half a mile. So they, they're clearly using very small pieces of water. Advetus niger is a species that's also declining, um, but is found in, in the chalk streams and in upland streams. Um, it's been wiped out in more industrial areas. Okay, stoneflies. Um, stoneflies, uh, there's more than 3,500 species worldwide, and we've got 34 or 35 in the UK. Um, there's one that's uh, thought to be extinct. Uh, in contrast to the mayflies, we've got two endemic species of stonefly and two endemic subspecies in the UK. And I'll, I'll finish up this uh, section with a little uh, to show you those as well. Um, again, the eggs are really distinctive. Um, these are uh, eggs of two species that we have in the UK, and you can see they've got really distinctive patterning on them. Um, they often have a series of, of little plates on them as well, which can be used to identify them. And many, many species of stoneflies are um, the, the females can't be identified um, themselves, but they can by the eggs. Now, the nymphs are. Um, typically chunky like this. Um, they've got two tails, always got two tails, and they've got two uh, long antennae, and they, look, they basically look the same both ends. They've got this sort of push and pull me sort of look. Um, this particular species has uh, external gills underneath its um, legs, it's just got these hairy armpits, if you like. Um, they've got these really strong um, legs with two claws on the end, um, but typically no external gills down the the, the body. Um, they're usually on the thorax um, or, uh, yeah, on the thorax. Um, they're most live for a year, um, as a, have a generation a year, and they molt slightly less than stone uh, mayflies. They molt between 10 to 35 times. Um, they all start off as herbivores uh, in, as small nymphs, um, but as they develop, the larger species become carnivorous partway through that group. In this particular species here, you can actually see the jaws, um, which are uh, used for eating other invertebrates. Um, mayflies tend to emerge, uh, most many mayflies emerge at the surface of the water, but stoneflies tend to crawl out at the shore to emerge, and some of them will crawl quite a distance. I've recorded um, nymphs uh, crawling, up, or, or nymphal and the skins after they emerged perhaps 25 um, feet away from the river and maybe 20 feet up a tree as well, you know, and, and up uh, bridge parapets and things like that. So they do try and get out of the way quite a bit. As, uh, um, and, and again, as, as same as the, stone, the mayflies, you can see the, when they're getting ready to emerge because their wings develop on the, on the thorax. And when they do emerge, they'll crawl out and they'll um, just, they'll, again, the, the thorax splits and they'll just crawl straight out onto the rock or the, the tree or, or whatever structure they're on. Um, the, you can see in this top image here that the, the wings are quite soft and, and flexible and the, the insect's quite pale when it, it does emerge and then it'll harden up to form the, the, the full adult. And the adult will usually um, uh, be underneath stones and things that will come out onto the shore and, and hide under stones. Sometimes you won't see them at all and the only evidence you'll actually have of stoneflies is the past exuvia um, on the stones or on the on the bank and um, next to the, the river. And this is the, you can still identify these, so you can collect these um, and look at them. The, the mistake many people make is try and identify them as adults but they're actually still the nymphs. Um, so you've got to use the, the key to nymphs to identify these exuvia. So um, just to have a look at some, uh, to have a look at the adults. Um, the adults are pretty much just the same as the, um, the nymphs, just with a set of wings on top. Um, there's the, the, the um, uh, genitalia develop um, on the adult, of course, and so the, there's differences in the, the structure of the end of the abdomen. But apart from that, they're, they're very, very similar. And um, some species, as I said, don't don't feed, but they will drink water, so they do have um, functioning mouths. Um, and then others have the the mouth parts. But it tends to be that the 
the, the mouth parts aren't used in the identification of the adult. And one thing that is unusual to stoneflies uh, in the river flies is that they exhibit bukifteri, which is having shortened wings in different conditions. This is out of a book which shows you know, the same species with varying degrees of short wings. So you've got on the left a fully winged insect and you've got um, various degrees from uh, uh, going down to Microptris at the, at the far uh, right. And this can be for a number of reasons. Um, you get sexual bukifteri. So on, this is um, Perlodes mortoni and on the top image is uh, a male with short wings, um, doesn't fly, it crawls around um, uh, on the bank, and the bottom is a fully winged female. And this is the actual feature that actually makes this one of our endemic species. Um, some species uh, have lost, have virtually lost their wings altogether. This is um, the oh, mistake, common black stonefly, as uh, written bifront, which is fully winged as an adult. But the, male um, doesn't have wings at all. You can just about see a little slither of wing there and it just looks it looks very like the, the, the nymph. Um, the other reason that you can have brachyptery is, is um, through environmental pressures and this is a graph of the wing length of um, Leuctra apophis in Scotland which is a really common species but as you go further up the hill if you like, up a mountain, um, you tend to find shorter and shorter wings on this species. And that's thought to just be an ad adaptation to, to the fact that they're poor flyers. And if they were to fly off, they would just get blown away to the next glen or wherever and might not get back to the river to, to uh, lay their eggs. So that's a, that's a different type of book history. That's, that, that's more environmental factors. The other unusual thing about stoneflies is how they communicate with find a mate. So hopefully you'll be able to hear this, but this is a this is a stonefly looking for its mate. And in this um, video, this sequence I'm going to show you, that in this particular one, the red uh, bits are the male, and then the blue bits are the female replying. In this one here, it's the other way around. The blue bits are the male and the red bits the female replying. You see the same sequence. And this is just a, a, a male on its own. What it's doing there is it's vibrating its um, abdomen. You've got a little hardened pad at the end of the abdomen that is vibrating off the substrate. Um, so it's on a twig or, or whatever. And I've just got a little video here to show you this happening. This is Neoptic nebulosa. So it'll do that and then the female will reply and then the male will move towards her and then they'll keep doing that until they, they find each other. Um, and the, these signals are so distinct that you can actually identify the species from these um, drumming signals and there's been several species that have been um, described purely on their drumming signal. Style. Um, another thing is that for stone, uh, stoneflies, uh, with the name fly in the name, you would think they would actually want to fly, but they're actually pretty poor flyers and they'd rather just do anything but fly. So here's some examples of how they, they move around. So we've got um, the one swimming in the top left, uh, where it's just using its wings to sort of like paddle its way through the water. The one in the middle top is just putting its wings up to 
is sail across the water, so it's catch the wind and then sail across the water. Um, the top right is using its wings as oars and is just rowing, um, with particularly its front wings, using its front wings as oars to row itself across the water. Some will jump off the water for a couple of, you know, they'll just use the water as a, a spring pad, as it, if you like, to jump off and then start and then land again, then jump off and move that way. Others will lift themselves up so they've got, still got two feet on the water, but then flap their wings as mad as they can and skate across the water. And then uh, the one at the far end that's just finished playing, oh, let's start it again. Um, this is one that um, uses all its legs and just flaps its wings and paddles and, and skates as fast as it can across the water. Um, so they, they really don't like flying. If they do fly, they tend to fly in a, in, in a, a pretty haphazard fashion. Um, they will be fairly direct. They just want to get to the bank and then, then crawl around. Um, but, and most of them will go, when they go back to lay their eggs, they'll, they'll either find somewhere where they can crawl onto the water and paddle across and lay their eggs as they do that. Or they'll jump, they'll climb as high as they can, jump off, open their wings and then sail across the water and then drop their eggs in a, in a ball into the water. So to finish up on the stoneflies, just some of our, uh, our endemic species. This is the um, February red, Caneoptrix nebulosa britannica. This is an endemic subspecies. Um, it's, it differs from the European species um, by the male, which is here on the right, having short wings. It's also got these incredibly long legs. And one of the reasons for that is so that it can actually walk across. It comes out very early in the, in the year, named the February red, but you can find it in January as well. And it, it comes out very early, there can be snow on the ground and it uses these legs to keep its body away from the snow because if the body was to get too uh, ice, it would probably die. But if it can keep its body up above the ice, it can survive in, in really cool temperatures. Um, this is a, another endemic subspecies, Capnia vidua anglica, um, which as we saw the, the common um, black stonefly, this one here it also has uh, is in the same family and has very small wings. And again, emerges very early in the year um, and is often found in upland areas. Um, and it's probably um, being impacted by climate change. We've seen this one already, which is Pelodes mortini, um, which is really common. Um, you can find it in most uh, watercourses or stony, fairly large watercourses north of. Um, the, the river, well, north, well, not in the southeast of England, but in, in the rest of the country, basically. Um, more common in the, in the upland areas. And then just before I show the next one, this is, the, this is perhaps unique in being a, a banknote that shows the type locality of an endemic species um, and, and a few other species as well. So this on the left here um, is the River Clyde. And this is the type locality for our, our final endemic species, which is the northern February red, Protectra pinnata. Again, it's an early season species. Um, the female is um, fully winged and the male is slightly short winged. We don't, we have not been able to get the male to fly. The females will fly really readily. But the males will, they're, they're dead easy to find because they'll come and congregate on these fence posts. So in the bottom right is a fence post alongside the River Spey, which had loads of these males on it, and the females were actually on the wires in between. And the, um, the, the males are, are feeding on the algae that are on, on top of the, the fence posts. So we, um, there's a real great way to survey for these species early in the season. Just get out there, have a look at fence posts and um, take a picture send it in and I'll identify it for you or, or have a go at identifying it yourself and then I'll confirm it. Um, and we can share that information for you after this. Okay, so final group is caddisflies. Um, so th this is a much larger group than the, <coughs> the, the stoneflies or mayflies and there's over 6, 16,000 species worldwide. And we've got 200 species in the UK, including one endemic subspecies. Um, they occur in a whole range of habitats from running waters, you know, fast flowing streams, canals, uh, lochs, 
lakes, ponds, um, and uh, you, you name it, you can find them. They have a, a different life cycle to the mayflies and stoneflies. So the mayflies and stoneflies um, develop directly. They don't have any um, pupal stage. They've got a, not got a um, metamorphosis um, within the life cycle. Whereas in the caddisflies, they do. So the adults will mate, um, they'll lay their eggs, and then um, they'll develop into, into larvae. And those larvae, um, and I'll explain in a minute, have two different types, generally two different types of larvae. One is a caseless, looks like a, a little caterpillar and, and crawls about on the, the bed of the river uh, or lake. And the other it, it builds a little case for it to live in and shelter in. Once it's ready to pupate, um, so the, these, sorry, these, um, these um, larvae develop um, differently to uh, mayflies and stoneflies. So the mayflies and stoneflies have a large number of um, instars, but with the stone, with the caddisflies, there's only um, around about five instars. So they develop um, in a, a much different way. And when they're ready to pupate, they, they create a pupil case where they have a little cocoon within there, which you can see in this image at the bottom, a little um, brown lozenge shape is the pupil cocoon. And they, they have stones all around that, um, or they'll seal up the end of the, the case and just pupate within it. And then they have this um, intermediate stage between the pupil, the pupa and the um, adult stage. Oops. Um, and this is this is a, a basically a, a swimming stage to allow it to get from the bed of the river or, or lake up to the surface. It's called a farate adult, so it's a, it's not a pupa and it's not an adult. It's this in, intermediate stage. And it's basically the adult in a swimming suit, in a in a diving suit. Um, so it's it's got these long legs that it can use, um, long appendages that it can use to to um, swim with. And when it gets to the surface big pair of jaws that it can actually op open that uh, that suit and get itself out onto the on as an adult and that's just an image of an adult coming out of that um, process onto the surface of the water. Like the mayflies that I showed um, in America, um, caddisflies can emerge in huge numbers. This is a, a swarm of Brachycentris subnubilis, the, the granum on um, the Wiltshire Avon, I think it is. Um, and yeah, you can get thousands upon thousands of these coming off at the same time. Um, and this is, a, this is a mating swarm, so that adults will then pair up um, and then move back to the river to, to lay its eggs. The, um, uh, the, the populations can vary year on year, but uh, we're in at uh, this particular, uh, it seems like in this particular cycle, we're in a, a couple of years of good granum patches at the moment. Uh, the granum is another one that goes under water to lay its eggs. So this is a piece of wood pulled out of um, the Avon, which has all these little green sacks of eggs on it. And this is where the granum has pulled itself under the, under the water and laid its eggs directly onto this there. Um, so you can see that um, some of these structures, such as bits of wood and, and bridge supports and things, can be really important for these insects. And if they're damaged or removed, um, they can they can have a major effect on the population. Other species um, lay their eggs by dropping, dipping their abdomen into, into the water um, as they're flying over. And then there's some that actually lay their eggs onto bankside vegetation, like this. This is um, Glyphotalia glucidula. Um, it's a fairly common um, uh, caddis fly. It lays its eggs on the bankside vegetation over, over um, overhanging the, the uh, river or, or pond. Then when it rains, the eggs wash off into the, into the pond, into the water. The, um, this is just a, another little summary of the, the life cycle. So you've got the, um, the larvae there in its case. Um, in the top left, it will then pupate, and in this case, it it just seals up the case and has the pupa inside that. And then in the bottom right, you can see that fairy adult, that that swimming pupa, 
it's up to you. Purpose. And then the adult in the bottom left. The adults are, are moth like. Um, they have got, uh, instead of moths which have scaly wings, these have got hairy wings. And that's one of the key ways of telling um, moths apart. Um, the other key features for identifying them are the um, mouth part, the, the palps. And if you just about see on this one here, the little spines that are on the legs help you separate the, the families. You get two different types. You get the case caddis. Um, these are, they live inside the case. They tend to have a very soft bodied um, larva uh, that's protected by the case. And the case can be made out of a whole range of different materials. The different species have different types of cases. Um, they do change their case some case style sometimes as they, they develop some species. But generally speaking, you can, you can learn a lot about what species it is you're looking at from the case that, you're, that you, you can see. Um, and you can see the examples here of um, ones that are made, the one in the middle there, which is a little purse of um, sand grains that are held together with a, with a uh, substance. Other ones are little strips of um, uh, plant material that have been um, torn off and then stuck back together as well. And then you get some really elaborate things with, um, with uh, lots of little gels and things in it um, and just uh, one, of, one of the things that uh, I was quite amazed with when I first started looking at caddis flies was there was a, there was a guy in um, France who was actually taking caddis out of the cases and putting them into um, little chambers with um, gold and silver flecks in it and the caddis would then rebuild their case with these, um, these materials and the, he, he calls it art, um, and it's kind of a bit of exploiting the insect, but, but these are the examples of what he is producing with these, or these caddis flies have been producing um, in the Arctic. Um, we've also got caseless caddis, and now these, are, uh, these don't build a case, they stay uh, mobile during their, uh, more mobile when they're out uh, and about. They, you can see that, in, you can see they've got external gills. So the, the case caddis, many of them have got external gills as well, but they're hidden inside the case. But these ones, you can actually see the gills uh, there. They're, um, the one on the bottom is Ryacophila, which is um, the only, probably the only truly free living caddis in, in the um, UK. It doesn't build a case at all or a shelter, um, but it will decay in a, a small case. The other two make little, um, I'll move on to the next slide. They make little shelters. These are little nets here on this stone on the, on the top right. And they, they make these uh, nets where they sit next to that and wait for stuff to get caught in there and then they go and feed on it. So they, they basically sieve the water of, of the trichus and, and then feed upon it. Um, and there's some fantastic footage on, I think it was on Twitter uh, just this week from Dewey Roberts who had shown Hydropsyche, the, the, the species at the bottom there, um, wrestling with a stone that had gone into its net. Um, so well worth looking out. Um, actually, looking at their nets, the Hydropsyche nets, you can tell if there's um, pollution in the river. You can tell if there's any per perturbation in, in their life cycle because they they make mistakes in their nets and the, they're not as uh, as uh, uniform as they should be. So you can see that the um, the Insects here are long and, and grub-like. Um, they've got the three pairs of legs of all insects, um, but they've got these pro legs at the end, which have a set of hooks, a hooked claw on the end of each. Um, sometimes people com confuse them with flying beetle larvae, um, like uh, coronamid larvae, um, or the, the, the um, uh, riffle beetle larvae, but the fly larvae never have these long three pairs of legs and the beetle larvae tend not to have these hooks on the on, on the back end. Although saying that the the um uh, the one group of beetles that does have hook like structures is the whirligig beetle and the larvae. Here are some adults here. Um, they're uh, like I said they're moth like and um, some of the Adaptations, you can see the different colorations here, and, so, and then the first two at the top 
and that's the male and the female. You can see there's a slightly different um, coloration for those two. They're quite large species found in still waters. Um, they're, uh, gosh, what size are they? They're probably about 20, 25 um, millimeters. And then the one on the um, next to it, Cernus macrolatus and Tenodes unicolor, a tiny little species. Um, with, and Tenodes lives in little galleries as a, as a larvae and then emerges out. You see quite a difference in the um, length of antennae as well. So you've got some that are fairly small antennae of very short antennae. And then you've got the two at the bottom there on either side, Mysticides um, zuria and Mysticides longicornis, which have these absolutely massive long antennae that are much longer than its body. And um, these are the longhorn caddis or longhorn sedges. Um, and uh, again, typical on, on still waters or slow flowing rivers. Um, so that's that's um, yeah. So that that's a, a selection of caddis. Like I say, there's 200 or uh, 200 species. Um, the one that I haven't mentioned here is actually there is one caddis which is doesn't live in water. It lives on land. Um, it's the uh, only found in the wire forest. Um, it makes a case just like the the, the case caddis do in water, but it lives in leaf litter instead. Um, Quite a, quite a cute little thing, it's quite nice to see. Okay, so moving on to collecting river flies and finish off. Uh, the, this is actually the picture that got me into river flies in the first place. I just could not believe that there could be that many uh, individuals coming off a river. And this is a, a bridge over the Mississippi and it just fascinated me, this picture. You know, they're all stuck to his legs and like iron filings over the, the bonnet of his car. Um, and this is this is why they use snowplows in Wisconsin to move to clear the, the roads. You can use all the the normal methods for collecting uh, adult uh, of of um, these these river flies. Um, you can sweep through vegetation, you can beat vegetation, and you can use a, a light trap um, to attract them. Particularly as caddis flies, the caddis flies are attracted to light and a few of the stoneflies are as well. Um, there's, a, there's a great group on Facebook called um, Moth Trap Intruders which always has a huge selection of caddis flies and, and people going on there, you know, myself and Sharon Flint and Ian Wallace, we all identify them for the, the moth trappers that are uh, putting them up there. We also get a few um, mayflies in there as well. Then the other thing you can do Thing, use things like um, malaise traps next to rivers. The only problem with malaise traps is that they collect an awful lot of stuff and uh, and there's a lot of collateral collect, uh, material um, collected and it's probably not wise to do if you're just looking, if you just want to look out for um, river flies that for your own interest. Sometimes you need to get quite close. Um, so, you know, they're all well, they're all benign, they don't, they, none of them are going to sting you and that, so you can get quite close in the net or in, you know, and, and often though, you can pick them up quite easily with your hand as well, um, just making sure you've got dry, dry fingers when you do it. Um, they're relatively um, docile, the caddis flies can get a bit, um, can, can, can uh, fly about quite a bit, um, but Generally speaking, the stoneflies just want to crawl about, and the mayflies will sit quite quite happily. Um, once you've got your um, got your uh, uh, specimens, you know you need to identify them and record them. Um, I help run the riverfly recording scheme, so I do the mayflies and stoneflies, and Ian Wallace does the caddisflies. Stuart Cross does adult caddisflies. and the recording schemes act as champions for these species. So we go out there and we tell people about these. We we shout about these species, um, we produce identification guides with the Field Studies Council and with the um, Freshwater Biological Association. We provide training opportunities and generally just encourage recording. And we also do a bit of research and conservation um, where we've, we've worked on eight species um, over the last couple of years, trying to find out more about them and so on. We've got, um, these are the, the different statistics for the, the recording scheme. So caddis flies on the right have been going the longest um, and have amassed the biggest data set of, of records. Um, mayflies is, is 
we oh, uh, uh, the, is the next one. Um, there's actually a, a little bit more than 210,000 now. Um, but there's still you can still see there's some white gaps on that map. And then stoneflies, there's still quite a lot to do for stoneflies, and, and you know, promote trying to promote stoneflies is something that's relatively easy to do with this um, fence post survey. So we can try and fill in some of these gaps as well. We collect evidence, so we've been looking at um, the March Brown um, here to see where it occurs because it's, uh, it's flying across Europe. Um, but in, it seems to be in, in Britain that it's doing quite well. So we've been doing this angler, a survey with anglers to, um, to see uh, where they're seeing the, this, this species. And the yellow may done, um, we've uh, um, done surveys to look at. It seems to be that it, it's, it emerges, it's got one generation a year, but it emerges en masse in May. And then there's another cohort that trickles out throughout the year. And what seems to be happening is that the, the mass emergence in May is getting less. There's more coming out across the year. So we're trying to just get evidence for that and um, observations from people. We've also done work to look at um, the orange striped stonefly, which is, uh, as I said, it was an endemic species. And we want to know if the species that we, we thought it was to begin with, um, which is widespread in Europe, actually still occurs in the UK as well. So we're looking for male um, specimens with long wings. As I said, we, we produce identification guides. So this is the identification guides that are available to the, the FSC, um, covering all the groups. Um, the stonefly one is only two families, um, but it's an introduction to the, the uh, key that's published by the FBA effectively. Um, so these are all available just now. The FBA has a caddisfly adult key that's available um, at the moment. And then there's two upcoming keys. So the one in the middle is the new pictorial guide to adult caddis um, that's been produced for the FSC. And then the, there's a new stonefly key coming out as well by the Victoria Biological and the caddis key is probably the closest to completion. And this is just an example of one of the, the sections in it. Um, which is going to tell you how to identify. It's going to tell you a bit about the species. And how to actually good photographs so that um, people can then identify these um, for themselves. We've got various um, species postcards that we try and highlight some species in different areas. And these are just the examples there. The, the wing window wing caddis um, is a rare species that's found on peat bogs in tiny little tussock pools. And we were wanting more records of that so that we could guide some uh, conservation action for it. And the yellow mayfly uh, on the other side is a species that um, was only, was originally found in the Usk, Wye and Thames, but had been lost from the Thames and the Usk, uh, declined massively on the, the, the Wye has since started to expand again and um, we were trying to get more records of that species from around uh, the, the Severn and other places in, in Wales and the, um, the idea was to give this out to moth trapping groups and it's been really successful. We've now got records from right up the Severn, right up to Preston Monford actually um, and and then we, this year we found we got records from the River Dee in Wales, which is a brand new river for it as well. So it's doing really well, that species, after years of decline. Um, we encourage everybody to put their records in iRecord. It's the most efficient way for us to deal with records at, at the recording scheme because we can verify them, we can comment on them, we can uh, query things and, and generally just communicate with the, the recorders. Um, the good thing about iRecord as well is you can go and have a look. You can go into the explore bit there and have a look at other records of that species. And some of them, as you can see at the bottom there, will have um, images on them. This is just one of Shannon Flint's records of uh, Dinocras epilotes. Which, you know, so you can actually go and compare your specimen that you're about to record with stuff that's, that's already been recorded, which is really useful. Um, we're quite active on social media, both um, Sharon and I. Uh, I cover the mayflies and stoneflies. She does the caddisflies and regularly post 
and Bob's on there about different species that we've we've just seen or we've we've encountered. Um, and there's also a few other people that are posting. Bob talked about who does um, uh, does post when he sees insects on the on the river as well. So that's another good way of finding out more about what's going on right now. Um, I've got a blog that I've kind of neglected for a wee while, but the, on there is lots of information about different mayfly species, mostly. Um, it's mostly about mayflies is the name of it. Um, but there's also some stonefly stuff on there as well, and conservation information on there. And finally, the um, just off the press is the Caddisfly Group, which has just been formed, um, and it's to try and get people that are interested in doing stuff on caddis flies to come together in, in one place and it's hosted by the, the Freshwater Biological Association um, but yeah, basically you can sign up there and you'll find out what's happening. I think they're planning to have little meetups and things as well when we, when we all go back to doing that sort of thing um, but there's lots of information on there and videos and, and there's going to be um, tutorials and things on there as well. Um, just to finish off, there's some links there to, uh, I think, uh, and I think Kieran's going to uh, put these up and or, or send them around later, but um, there's some links to the various things there. There's the um, my email address, um, Bug Life's web address, Twitter handle, the Riverfly Partnerships um, the pages for the Riverfly recording scheme, so the information for the schemes is on there. Um, and my blog and I record if you've not found it already. And just finally, the recording schemes, we host them at Bug Life in Scotland. Um, if you are wanting to get in touch, you know, just pick up a line and probably the best email and um, I'll get back to you. And that's me. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Craig. We've got lots and lots of questions already, so I'm going to dive <laughs> straight in. Um, when you're talking about mayflies earlier, uh, did you say that they molted 50 times? Clive wanted to know. Yes, yeah, um, up to 50 times, some species. Yeah. Bro. And then Amy was asking off the back of that, what's the evolution, evolutionary sorry, advantage to this? Because this is surely quite energy intensive. Yeah, I don't think they're particularly evolutionary uh, uh, efficient mayflies. And they are the oldest winged insects. So they've been around since 300 odd million years. Um, and they've not evolved an awful lot in that time, some of these species. Um, so it's probably a hangover from when they, they had to do that. Um, uh, it's not energy efficient at all. I mean, so, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, Jenny was asking about mayflies again. What conditions are needed to determine the hatching? Is it sort of temperature based or are pheromones involved? No, um, so so it, it's mostly temperature, it's um, light as well. So you, you find that if you've got a very dull day, um, you, you've had a warm day the day before and you've got a dull day, um, they won't hatch until later in the afternoon. They, they tend to wait until it's, it's a bit brighter. Um, they, but mostly it's temperature. They, they've got to get out of the water before it gets too warm for them. Um, and on a, any individual day, it'll be what happened yesterday and then what happened on that day so yeah great thank you amy i can see that you've got your hand up do you want to unmute yourself and ask craig your question i think you're still on mute at the second okay there we go i i was interested in the mass emergencies um and whether these river flies could be used for human food given their massive emergencies yeah so they are used as, as human food and um, not in not in the west but in africa um the locals the, there's a mass emergence um on lake victoria and the locals actually use um they, they collect them up together with the midges that come off there and make them into little patties and it's one of the main sources of protein a regular source of protein as well you know it's every 28 days or something have you tasted them? Uh, yeah, they taste kind of nutty. <laughs> um, they're they're eaten they're eaten in in uh, various other countries as well. But yeah, they, they taste kind of nutty. Um, I don't don't know if it's uh, pleasant or not. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Cool. Well, thank you, Amy. Um, Leo was asking in the chat, is it true that adult mayflies only live for a day? Um, most only live for a day, but some species um, can live longer. So the, the, the two species in the UK that definitely live longer is uh, the March brown Ruthogena germanica, which hatches in really early in the season, you know, maybe uh, middle of March. And uh, it will go and sit up in the top of trees for anything up to uh, two weeks as a sub imago. Um, the other one that uh, it definitely has a longer adult life is that one that I said was really successful, Chloeon diptrum. And that's, it, it comes off the water um, after, mo uh, after mating um, and it uh, goes off and it actually just states its eggs. So it actually lays eggs that hatch immediately and it'll stay and just state its eggs on the, on the, on the bank for seven days or so before going back and laying these eggs. And as the eggs hit the water, they hatch and the nymphs swim off. That's amazing, thank you. Uh, Rich A, you've got your hand up, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, thanks very much. Excellent uh, talk by the way. Um, one thing you didn't mention though that is that uh, mayfly nymphs are used to uh, detect water quality and um, we are really concerned about the collapse in, in mayfly numbers. I've, I've been fishing, dry fly fishing for 50 years and I've seen a huge, huge, to the extent where I, I almost don't bother to try and match the hatch now. But it, it, it's this artificial pyrethrum that's the problem. It, the, the European Union banned uh, the, 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 the pesticides that were killing farmers, uh, and then they put one that uh, are safe to farmers. So surprise, surprise, the farmers aren't that careful with them, I guess. Uh, but I mean, what's being done about monitoring these, these insect numbers and, and what's being done to stop these pyrethrums getting into the water supply? Well, that's a whole different problem. Um, but Yes, it, it's a massive issue, um, and I don't think it, it isn't just the pyrethrins. Um, so to, to answer the first bit, what's been done to monitor them, the Riverfly Partnership have a massive scheme of people going out and monitoring this and uh, uh, and reporting back to the, with uh, reporting back against sort of like bigger levels um, that the EA have agreed, and which is really successful in, in highlighting gross pollution events and um, your uh, your example of the pyrethroids and other chemicals and um, yes some of those will be gross pollution events and you'll see it uh, immediately but some things are just a general decline because of chronic pollution um, I say it's not just the pyrethrins because we've done some work at bug life looking at um, various other chemicals and, and particularly neonicotinoids yeah, yeah. in water and what we've discovered is that actually some of the worst neonicotinoid pollution isn't coming from agriculture, it's coming from towns. And we, and, and certainly, and, and what we think is happening, and, and we've got some evidence uh, on that, is that it's actually coming from pet flea treatments. Huh. Yeah. You know, because we're do all dosing our pets with these flea treatments, and then it's just getting washed off, or it's been, you know, that they're, they're peeing it out into. Sure. into the environment or we're washing their bedding and and it looks like that is a major source and sewage treatment works aren't stopping this from getting into the river yeah. um so yeah so there is work going on um i'm that's part of my role at bug life is to try and uh chastise water companies and and various other people to actually tackle this and um, we've got a phd student who's looking at the pet flea treatment issue at the moment um but yeah is a, is a big issue and yeah i don't i don't see bug life actually promoting much you know trying to get european union to ban things trying to trying to promote this generally you know in the general public it's, it's it seems to be something which is internal and the art of artificial estrogens are a big problem as well of course yeah yeah, yeah. It, it is a serious issue and i think because there's such such much the canary in the in the, uh, the coal mine we re we rely yeah. on them so much you also didn't mention that they're important food for, for trout of course <laughs> yes yeah. yeah so they're great creatures Anyway, thanks for having your call. Thank you. Um, Jane was asking before when you're playing those recordings of the stoneflies, can we actually hear them or do you need specialist equipment to be able to hear them? Not at all. You can hear them uh, yourself. And if you collect a stonefly, uh, depending if it's a, a, you know, it's been mated or not, um, you can actually, I've got a little, this is just a bit of cardboard here that I've folded into a box and you can stick it in there 
stick your your I, I've got an app on my phone which is a, a a dictaphone app which you that only records when there's sound and I'll stick it I'll stick this box on top of of my iPad overnight and it'll just record away and you'll record any sound that the the stonefly is making you can see it and, and you know if you can you can sometimes if you're really lucky you'll see it on the bank side where something's sitting on a twig or something it'll suddenly just do what that that stonefly was doing in the the video <laughs> that's great thank you uh david you've got your hand up do you want to ask your question yeah this is a quick question if, if i you know find some of these collection these, i'll probably have to hang on to the specimens for a while until i can get somebody competent to tell me if i've got it right so what what's the best way to preserve specimens of these groups um, so the best way to preserve them, uh, so in the olden days, um, they used to pin them all. Um, so they used to, you know, kill them and then and then pin them and have a, a pin collection. But if you go back and have a look at those collections now, they're just basically a, a thorax on a on a stick sort of thing. Cause they, they, they're really fragile insects. So um, if we're preserving um, insects for identification, we'll use um, semi alcohol um, and in the past, when we've had anglers uh, helping us out, we've just said to them, with the collection, we've said to them to stick them in some vodka because that's enough to get it home, basically to me or get it to me, and then I can uh, identify them. I don't reuse really the vodka though. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I'm just conscious of time. I'm going to squeeze in one last question. You... I just see the point coming up there. She says, "Are please photograph in the field and don't kill them." Well. Um, about, I would, yes, of course. And for the more recognizable ones, yes, you can do that. But there are some that you just cannot identify in the field of, can't identify from photographs. Great, thank you. Uh, Yuli, you've got your hand up. Do you want to ask your question? Are you there? I'm on mute. Okay, I'm gonna switch. Sorry, oh, there we go. Uh, I want to ask if I do the river fly monitoring for 11 years, do you get the results? Um, I can get the results, I can get them through the um river fly partnership website. Yes, okay. Can you see any difference regionally how the results are developing? Um I've not looked at that, but that would be something that would be really interesting to have a look at. Yeah, we we do have um, we have been looking at uh, environment agency data to see how their results um, vary across um, areas, and that's quite interesting. There are some hot spots and and not spots if you like for for water quality. Maybe another question. If we notice in our river fly monitoring, we do it three times a year, one in spring, one in summer, one in autumn. If I notice in one of my sites, I do two sites, the figures are down. Are you interested to hear it? We are supposed to record it or to report it to our group manager and then we lose a little bit control what's happening with the results. Sometimes they land with the EA, but then we don't hear anything back. Are you interested to get results when we are really getting low figures? So I think I think that yeah, that would be interesting. But I think to go through the Riverfly partnership rather than come straight to Bug Life, um, just to manage that, I think because that they've got that structure for hubs and and so on. But the uh, it is. What, the reason I say that is because that there are there can be reasons why you don't get the same results every season. And um, you know, in the summer, everything's hatched off. Um, you can have very um, few nymphs or very small nymphs in the in the river. We have a thing in Scotland where you know, in the autumn, you have a a, a famine on the hill locks because there's just no insects around because they've all hatched off or they're all in the egg stage. Okay, maybe a last question. I have the feeling, I have not proof of it, but I have the feeling, having done this for 11 years, that the size of the larvae, which I have in my nets, are slightly decreasing in, in, in average, on average. Can you support this or not? So that, that's interesting. Um, 
in in species that have more than one generation a year uh, the the speed of the generation uh, the development affects the the, the growth um, so you find that the uh, in the spring samples of Betis rodani, the, the large dark olive, you'll get large nymphs. But by the time you're getting your second or third generation, they're maybe about half that size. Um, so that is quite interesting, and it could it could be something to do with that. Um, I would need to see. We need to have you know proper uh, lengths and things calculated, and then see what we what we can draw from that but, uh, and what species it was that you were actually looking at. Good answers. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. I know there's lots more questions in the chat, but I'm not going to be able to get through them all. Sorry, we've overrun slightly already. Um, so thank you, Craig, for joining us today and sharing your knowledge with us. And thank you to everyone that has joined us as well. I'll send around those links uh, that Craig put up at the book, uh, sorry, at the end of his presentation in a follow-up email. It's just 